let me just try and share my screen. Yep. So uh, hopefully you are you're looking at some PowerPoint slides there. Uh, if you're not, now is the perfect time to complain very loudly. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, like yourselves, I, uh, I organize events. I organize two meetups in Belfast uh, in Northern Ireland that have gone virtual as well. And uh, what one of the few advantages of the current situation is that we can invite people from all over the place. So uh, now, now that we're running virtual events, anybody, anybody can attend from anywhere and uh, we can invite speakers from all over the world. And uh, that, that is a good thing. And uh, hopefully something that we'll keep doing uh, even when the pandemic ends. And uh, as you say, hopefully that will be very soon. Right, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about my talk. Uh, this is a fusion talk. Um, I know I'm, I have an experienced audience here, so um, everybody I'm talking to will be familiar with one of these, and perhaps two, three, four of these, uh, but hopefully there is something here that will be new for everybody. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and bring together yeah, a, uh, a pile of different areas. So uh, we're going to be talking about Kotlin the language and how Kotlin can be used with Spring 5. And uh, with Spring 5, you have the choice of doing either um, reactive or traditional networking. So we are going to be doing uh, reactive programming. We're going to be uh, accessing an HTTP API through Webflux, which is one of the ways that you can do reactive programming in, uh, in Spring. And uh, we're going to be accessing uh, a space instance. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that is, we'll go into detail in just a minute. And uh, that's going to be as part of our automation. So uh, the company I work for, uh, we're automating the creation and population of space instances. So we'll, uh, we'll bring that in. And the way that we're doing it at scale is by creating a DSL, because that's one of the things that Kotlin is really good at. So um, we're going to uh, try and tie together all of these threads. So hopefully there will be something that's of interest for everybody. Uh, just to say, these slides, um, I've already made them available. So uh, the uh, the URL for the slides will be published, uh, I think, just after the talk. And then uh, all the code that I show you, um, I may have been tinkering with it to the last moment. I know it, it's shocking that that could happen in our industry. Uh, but I will take all the code that I'm about to show you, and uh, I will put it in a Git repo and uh, make the URL of that available as well. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Garth Gilmore. I was a full-time software developer for five or six years. And then the opportunity came up to uh, go into professional services. So to do consulting, coaching, mentoring, training, all that kind of thing. And uh, I thought, I'll give it a go. You know, uh, I'll probably only last about six months. And uh, that was 20 years ago. Uh, so I started out teaching Java to C++ developers, uh, then C Sharp to uh, Java developers, uh, then uh, Java to C Sharp developers, because our industry can't make up its mind. And uh, the, these days, I pretty much teach everything to everybody. Um, but we spend most of our time at Instill uh, doing Kotlin and TypeScript. You know, that those would be our two main languages. So uh, those would be the ones that these days I spend most of my time in. So we, we help teams uh, adopt and use uh, Kotlin and TypeScript uh, based frameworks. Uh, so at the moment, we're, we're doing an awful lot of React uh, with TypeScript and, uh, and Angular as well, of course. Yeah. So uh, th that's who I am. And uh, this is in still the company, uh, as it was Christmas 2019. Uh, one of the advantages of taking the photograph is that you don't have to be in it. Yeah. And uh, the, these are the, a few of the clients that we've worked with. So actually, uh, most of what we do is software development. Uh, about 70% of the business is developing software uh, in conjunction with other companies. Uh, I'm the other bit. <laughs> so I run the, uh, the training team. And uh, we have three full-time trainers and uh, three associates as well. So here's the, the agenda for the talk. So first of all, I'm going to be talking about the big problem that we faced. OK, so this time last year, we had a very big problem. I uh, didn't everybody. And uh, one of the ways that we uh, got around it was by using JetBrains Space. OK, so if you're not familiar with JetBrains and not familiar with Space, don't worry. Uh, we'll, we'll introduce those in just a second. And uh, we came up with a way of automating 
how we were using JetBrains space instances. Um, so what I'm going to do is we'll do the traditional hello world example and uh, show you the basics of how you can talk to space remotely uh, using Kotlin and Spring and reactive programming. And then we'll introduce Maurice. OK, so the, uh, the Maurice is the code name for the application that we built that actually has practical value, you know, that uh, that delivers something for us as a business. And then, of course, we'll uh, we'll do some conclusions. So, so uh, should take about an hour or a little bit less. OK, if you have any questions, please just ask them in the chat and uh, I'll try and answer them at an appropriate time, uh, either immediately yeah, or when we get to the uh, the right point in the presentation. So what was our big problem? Well, I don't know if you heard, but we're in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, this time last year, uh, things started getting very, very grim. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in, as individuals, you know, we had an awful lot of pain in our personal lives. Yeah. But uh, just thinking about as a company, uh, we had a lot of pain as well. So the, the first kind of pain was for the software development teams. But I think what the industry has found is that if you're in industry is software development, well, you were ready <laughs> for distributed team working because uh, software development teams were already uh, partially distributed. Uh, there was a lot of working from home. You know, at Instill, we would have teams working for uh, partner companies in Canada and UK, Europe, and so on. Yeah. So uh, software development teams were already maybe halfway towards distributed development. Uh, but as a training team, we weren't <laughs> okay so uh, our competitive advantage was based on flying around the world and going into the client and doing a tailored delivery and going to individual developers and explaining the same thing eight or nine times uh, until we found the way that they could understand it best you know that that was the thing one thing that we did and we did really really well uh, so what happens as a business when the one thing you do really, really well, you can't do anymore? <laughs> OK, that's uh, that's a problem. Yeah. So uh, uh, the, on the software development side of Instill, things got very, very difficult. Yeah. On the training side of Instill, well, we were facing an existential crisis. You know, so how do we keep doing what we're doing? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we were very anxious. Yeah. So uh, in February, March of last year, uh, I was very, very anxious indeed. And uh, we realized what we needed to do was we needed to build up a, uh, a virtual training business. OK, so in the same way that our conferences and meetups like this and so on have gone virtual, well, we realized that we needed to take our training virtual as well. And uh, we came up with three ways of doing it. The first two you don't really care about, but we said, OK, we'll have multiple instructors in a delivery and we'll be very flexible with the timing. So we'll rule exercises in with breaks and lunch and give you work to do overnight and so on. But as much as possible, uh, let you work at your own pace and uh, fit in uh, childcare or, uh, you know, any other extra tasks that you might need to do. But then the bit that does interest you is we said, OK, uh, we're going to go out and make use of specialized tools, because, of course, as software developers, we already have an awful lot of tools uh, for doing distributed development. So we know how to do messaging. You know, we know how to do chats. We know how to collaborate through Git repos. We know how to manage versioning, you know, all this kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, if you were setting up a, a distributed software team, you had lots and lots of tools at your disposal. Uh, but in a sense, the uh, the lots and lots of tools is the problem, OK, because pretend you're a professional services team and instead of like a, a two year development, you're doing one week of training. OK, so you can't go to the client and say, please install these six tools, these eight tools, these 12 tools uh, for one week of training. It's not going to work. OK, uh, so uh, we couldn't go to clients and ask them to install a big bag of stuff uh, just for one week's training. You know, that that wasn't going to work. So fortunately, uh, we'd heard of JetBrains Space. Uh, so uh, we were uh, at Kotlin Conf in 2019. We actually ran a workshop there. And uh, as a result, we were there for the, uh, the launch of JetBrains Space. And uh, this was the perfect thing that we needed uh, for doing distributed workshops and training courses and so on. OK, so what on earth is space? Well, Here's an instance of space here. Yeah. So uh, JetBrains, as I'm sure you know, are uh, the company who do uh, IntelliJ and a bunch of other IDEs and development tools and so on. Um, 
And uh, this is what they launched in 2019. So um, Space is an umbrella tool uh, that tries to bring together all the different things that you, were need, you would need if you were doing distributed development, okay? So um, I have an instance here, and uh, this is an instance that we used for internal training uh, uh, just after Christmas. So uh, I have permission to share this, yeah? So uh, you see, if I go in, uh, I can just go to the top, and we can see, yep, you know, this is for in some internal training that we did on TypeScript and uh, AWS. And if I go to the left hand margin here, I can see the people who attended the training. You know, so these are the, the people who were involved in this internal training. And there's me there. You know, so I can enter data about myself. I can sort out my calendar, meeting, absences, all that kind of thing. Uh, and then I can do blogging, okay? So I can go inside here and uh, I can publish blogs and do the usual things and uh, add images and lists and checkboxes and all this kind of stuff, checklists, I should say. Uh, I can go in and I can add uh, uh, various things here for blogging. And then uh, I can go up here and uh, people can read my blogs and then they can open discussions with me, okay? So I've got various chat channels, yeah? So uh, I can chat to individuals, I can group talk to groups of individuals, I can create general chat channels, all that kind of thing, uh, just like you might go out and do in Slack. Uh, and then I have projects. So uh, uh, you can have as many projects as you like, and uh, an individual project can have as many repositories as you like, okay? So uh, each project can have multiple repositories, and uh, I can go into an individual repository, and I can see the commits that were made, I can see the files, all this kind of thing. And uh, so just go in here, and let's just open up. There we are there, you know, so uh, the, there's some example code from our TypeScript course. Um, so you see what I mean whenever I say it's an umbrella tool, and uh, it's a one-stop shop for doing distributed software development. So uh, I can go in and I can register people in Teams. I can do blogging to describe setup and requirements and all the rest of it. I can create projects with repos, and uh, I can create chat channels. So uh, it, it gives you uh, everything you need. Um, for at least small to medium sized projects. Now, of course, uh, you might still choose to go with a best of breed solution. You might say, forget that, you know, uh, I'm gonna go out and pick the best tool for version control and the best tool for messaging and so on. And uh, you can do that in distributed development. Uh, you can't do that if you're coming in for one week or one month or three months at the most uh, to do professional services. Uh, so uh, we absolutely love space because it gives us everything we need. So inside space, you've got profiles, teams, projects, repositories, uh, all that kind of thing. Uh, these are the different things that you can manipulate. You know, you can uh, read through the list for yourself. And uh, these are a, a few nice little screenshots. So uh, this is the development for uh, KTOR, yeah, which is uh, a framework for creating RESTful services. So uh, you can go to the space website and... Uh, you can get lots of examples like this of uh, visualizing a Git repo and commits that they've made uh, while they were building KTOR and discussions that they had, uh, code reviews, uh, all that kind of thing. So uh, we've been using Space now and uh, we've done about 50 deliveries, 50 virtual deliveries last year, and it's been very successful for us. OK, uh, but there's a problem. And uh, the problem is that we have to create an instance for every delivery. So to ensure privacy, uh, if you uh, book some training with us, we create an instance of space for you. Um, so we're creating instances all the time and we're doing all the setup each time. And, you know, that's a little bit annoying. So normally, if you were creating a new project, you would uh, bring up the instance and then you would keep using that same instance for months or years and all would be good. Yeah. But at the moment, we can be setting up three or four instances per week, uh, and that's a problem. So um, we don't want to have to do manual configuration. Uh, we want to be able to do uh, automation. So we want to automate the setup of space instances. And uh, there's a nice way of doing that. So what you can do is I can go inside here, and you see it says HTTP API Playground, OK? So I can drill inside here, and uh, it can let me send test requests to the server, OK? So I can go in here, and uh, I can click on a link, 
and uh, it'll build a sample request for me here on the right hand side and uh, I can curl it or I can see what it would be like in JavaScript, you know, and so on. So uh, I can go out and send this request in a variety of different ways. And uh, if there's mandatory information, I can enter it in the middle there. But I can go out and run it and get some information back. And uh, because I've already logged in, uh, there are no security concerns. You know, that's why they call this the playground. Uh, so uh, I can go in and issue all kinds of requests. Yeah. So, for example, in terms of teams and profiles, I could go out and I could ask for uh, all of the profiles or all of the profiles for um, users in a particular team or with a particular rule and so on. And then, of course, I could create new ones as well. So what we did was we said, OK, this is good. <laughs> you know, uh, let's use uh, this HTTP API to uh, to automate how we use space. OK, so uh, I'm going to walk you through the code for how we actually went out and did this. OK, and uh, the, the first one is just going to be the standard hello world. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to go out and send this request here. So we're going to go out and uh, ask for a listing of all the profiles in the current space instance. So um, uh, at Instill, we're very familiar with Spring. <laughs> okay, what we've done an, an awful lot of projects with Spring and Spring Boot. So uh, I've been using Spring Boot since the, uh, the earliest days, since all the configuration was manual and done in XML. So um, anytime you know, what we want to build an enterprise application, uh, we reflexively reach for Spring Boot. And uh, the modern way of doing Spring Boot, of course, is with the initializer. You know, here it is here. So I can go in and uh, I can pick my language of choice. Uh, any JVM language would work. OK, so just to prove the point, you know, uh, I've done Scala courses where we've written Spring Boot applications and Scala and so on. But the, uh, the, the main ones are Java. Kotlin and Groovy. Okay, so Kotlin has been an officially supported language for uh, for some time now. So uh, just to back up a little bit, uh, just in case you're not familiar with Kotlin, uh, Kotlin is one of the languages that's trying to take over from Java at the moment. So uh, uh, as you know, in the uh, the mid 2000s, the uh, the pace of evolution in Java slowed, and uh, lots of people went out and created languages that were alternatives to Java. Uh, so that the ones that most people are familiar with, uh, if you work in the Java space, is um, you'll have heard of um, Kotlin. Uh, you'll have heard of Scala, yeah, and uh, there are a couple of others that we might get to talk about later, yeah. So um, uh, Kotlin is very, very nice. So Kotlin was invented by JetBrains, and uh, it gives you everything you need. You know, it's kind of a, a modern, updated Java uh, with all the unnecessary syntax taken out, uh, really good support for functional programming. You know, it's just a, it's a nicer language. And uh, at Instill, we took a big bet on Kotlin about five years ago. So we went out and we said, look, uh, we're doing a lot of mobile development. We're doing a lot of server side development in Java. Uh, a lot of this would be much nicer if we did it in Kotlin. And uh, at the time, Kotlin was fairly new. So we were taking a little bit of a risk. But we said, what the hell, we'll give it a go. Yeah. So uh, we went full Kotlin about five years ago. And uh, we've never uh, regretted that choice. You know, so it's a very, very nice language. Cool. So uh, using the Spring Initializer, we can go out and uh, we can create a Spring project using the uh, the language of our choice. So we're going to be going for Kotlin. Uh, and then if I go inside here and say add dependencies, I can choose which bits of Spring Boot I want. OK, so if I go in here and say web, uh, you'll see that there are multiple web frameworks I could go for. So uh, I could go for the old one, which is Spring MVC, or I could go for the new one, uh, which is Webflux. Yeah. So Webflux is the, uh, the new API for creating and accessing RESTful services, and uh, it's all based around reactive programming. So um, if I want to be modern and up to date, uh, I would go for the reactive web uh, part of Spring Boot. And uh, that's the bit that bundles Webflux. And then I would also need to go out and uh, we're going to be doing OAuth. Yeah. So I would need to go there and I would need to include the, the OAuth client. Yeah. Because I'm going to be logging in uh, to the, uh, the space instance. And uh, that's all done. Uh, using OAuth, yeah. So uh, I need to install separately the OAuth support. 
Uh, but I've already gone out and done that. Uh, so that's already been achieved. Uh, here are the settings here that I used. Uh, you can, of course, try this for yourself. And uh, I get a little project into which I can insert my code. Uh, but just before we do that, uh, we have to register the application in space. So, of course, I've already done that, but here's the steps that I would go through. You know, So I would just go to the administration menu and I would go to applications and I would say, I'd like a new application, please. And you see I've created one here, uh, GDG Dubai sample. Uh, that's going to be the, uh, the name of the thing. Uh, and then once we've got it up, uh, you can see it's there and I'm the owner. And then I can go in and I can choose how I'm going to authenticate. So uh, my knowledge of OAuth is not great, uh, but I know there are different OAuth flows uh, that you can use. And uh, the simplest possible one is the client credentials flow. So this is where the application is trying to log in itself. It's not trying to log in on behalf of the user. Okay, So it's just the application logging into space. Uh, it's not the user trying to log into space through the application. Uh, which would be a lot more complicated. So uh, that's the uh, that's the default now, which is probably a good thing. And uh, whenever it uh, registers the application, it'll give me a client ID, which identifies the app, and it'll give me a secret. You know, so this is essentially my my password for logging in. So uh, I want to keep that private. Uh, and then I can choose what rights I want the application to have. Hey. So uh, the way it works in Spring. Uh, at, at the Hello World level is uh, you're going to have your application.properties file and inside there, that's where I would need to put the details uh, that we just created. So I've created an application in space and uh, it's given me a client ID and it's given me a secret. So I can go to my Spring Boot application.properties file and uh, I can enter that information, okay? So this is the, uh, the set of values uh, that I need to to add in order to make my OAuth login work. And you see there, it's all done using a, uh, a code. So I say spring.security.oauth2.client.registration name. Okay. Uh, so you see there, we've got uh, GDG Dubai, and uh, that's the same all the way down. Okay. So uh, all of these settings are going to be grouped together under the key uh, GDG Dubai. So uh, in my Kotlin code in a minute, uh, I can just say, give me the GDG uh, Dubai OAuth security settings, and I'll be able to read uh, all of these in one go. Yay. Uh, so what I need to do is uh, I need to create a web client. So in Spring Boot and uh, in the WebFlux library, the web client type is how we can send requests to the server. Uh, but I don't want to create just any web client. Yeah, I want to create a web client which is capable of doing a, uh, an OAuth uh, uh, authorization uh, against my space instance. Um, so this is how we do it here. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Spring, we have a configuration class. And uh, a configuration class contains one or more bean provider methods. And a bean provider method is just a method that can be called to build something. So this here is a method that can be called to build a web client. Uh, in, in Kotlin, the return type goes at the end of the function. So, uh, so there it is there. So this is a bean provider method. In other words, this is a method that can build a component. And uh, the component that it's building and returning is a web client. So uh, if I just wanted a regular web client, I would only need that bit at the bottom there. Uh, but because uh, it's a web client that's going to use OAuth, well, then I have to go through this little dance at the top. And uh, here I did what everybody else do does. I went and looked it up in a tutorial. <laughs> okay, So uh, I went out and did some research yeah, and uh, worked out uh, how to write this code. Yeah, the only thing that's special is you see here, we're saying set default client registration ID, uh, GDG Dubai, yeah, and uh, that links us back to these settings here, okay? So that's the thing that loads in uh, the OAuth settings that are specific to our space instance, yeah. So once I've written this code, I've called, I've told Spring Boot, yeah, how it can create a web client which can connect to my space instance uh, via OAuth. You know, so so now we're we're getting good to go. Yeah. Uh, so I need to create some types because I'm going to be sending a request and getting back responses. So uh, I need to create Kotlin types. 
for the uh, the data that's going to be up and down over the network. And uh, again, if you're new to uh, to Kotlin, uh, you can see that uh, compared to Java, it's very terse. You know, so the declaration of the class and the declaration of the constructor uh, have been ruled together. So here, uh, whenever I create a name object, uh, it'll have properties. It'll have fields uh, called first name and last name, and the getters and setters will be written for me and so on. Uh, and I've got single expression functions. Uh, so if the body of my function is just going to be a line of code, well, then I don't need the braces. And uh, of course, inside the strings, I have string interpolation. So the, uh, the, the dollar means value of. Uh, so you can think of Kotlin as just a much, much nicer version of Java, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, uh, Scala, Kotlin and so on, uh, these were all written with the mission of being a better Java. You know, uh, in each case, the founders sat down and said, right, if we were reinventing Java, you know, uh, Java for the 2000s, uh, what would it be? Cool. So uh, those are the types that uh, represent our domain model. And then here's our console application. OK, so in fact, just before I show you that, uh, here's the code that's going to go up to our space instance and retrieve the profiles. OK, so uh, we're going to be using the web client. You see there we're passing in the web client and then we're going to be saying dot get sending a get request to the server. This is the URL that we're going to send it to whenever we say retrieve the exchange of request to response will actually happen. Uh, and then what we're getting back is we're getting back a, a reactive stream. Because if you're using Webflux, it models everything using reactive streams. So uh, this is where we have a little bit of tension, yeah, because the designers of Spring Boot are kind of looking ahead to the future. And uh, in, they're saying in the future, um, all APIs are going to be reactive. You know, so instead of sending a, a request up and then having a wait and getting back a response containing 30 things, well, um, we're going to be using something like WebSockets and uh, we're going to get 30 individual things. You know, they're going to be sent down to us one at a time. So uh, if you're adopting Webflux, you're basically taking a bet uh, that the future of um, RESTful APIs is reactive. Um, but of course, here, uh, we're just going to get back uh, a response which contains all the profiles. Yeah, because there's no need for this B to be a, a reactive API. If the, if the space HTTP API was reactive, uh, that would be massive overkill because I'm not going to have a space instance with hundreds of thousands of individual users. You know, um, uh, that, that, that would be a bit strange. So uh, what I can do here is uh, I can take the information out of the response and uh, I can convert it yeah, into a, uh, a stream of profiles. Yeah. So inside Webflux, there are two things to know. A flux is uh, a reactive stream and a mono is a reactive stream of just one item. OK, so Webflux is called Webflux because you're working with fluxes. Yeah. And uh, a flux is a reactive stream which can hold any number of items. And then a, uh, a mono is a reactive stream which can hold zero or one items. Uh, so one of the things with reactive programming, I'm sure many of you will have experienced this already. Uh, once you start reactive, you have to keep going. <laughs> you know, So uh, once your application is partially reactive, uh, it very quickly ends up becoming entirely reactive. And in a sense, that's that's the idea, You know, because we don't want to be blocking. We don't want to have something waiting and something else elsewhere in our application. Uh, but in simple cases, it can be a bit annoying. So uh, all I want to do here is just print out details of all the profiles, then all the profiles, and then a message to say we're done. OK, so what I'll do here is header is going to be a mono. Remember, a mono is a reactive stream that only contains a single item. Yeah. So a uh, header is a reactive stream containing just one string. Uh, footer is going to be a reactive stream containing just one string. And then profiles is going to be a reactive stream, which is a flux. You know, it's going to contain many profiles. OK, uh, but what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to map it there to convert each profile into a, uh, a string. And then it can go down here and I can concatenate them all together. So uh, I've now got one flux, which contains the initial message. Yeah, the flux of profiles converted to strings and the, uh, the footer message. And then all I need to do is subscribe to that. Yeah. So as things come down the reactive stream, uh, we're going to call print line on each one. 
So we'll print out details of all the profiles, then each profile converted to a string, and then the all done message. Yeah. Now, I've deliberately written this as a command line application. OK, so you see here this code is actually a command line runner object. Um, so in Spring Boot, if you want to create a console application, uh, you give it a command line runner, you know, and uh, the, the code inside there will be run uh, in the same way that the main method of a standard Hello World app would be run. Uh, so I have to keep the main thread alive. That's what we're saying. So that's uh, that's why we have this read line here. So asynchronously, I'll be going out and retrieving the details of all the profiles and printing them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the main thread is going to wait, you know, until all of that has been done. So that's the, the reason for the read line there. Now, of course, we wouldn't want that or need that in anything other than a Hello World command line application. Oh, so uh, we can go out and run it. You know, there's the main method there that just hands over control to Spring Boot. So just to show you it works, uh, this is the code, which I'll put up in a, a repo uh, after the talk. Uh, it's just everything that we've just walked uh, walked through. So you can give this a go yourself. Uh, so I can go inside here and run it. Goes out and runs it, goes to the space instance and successfully retrieves the details of all the profiles, you know? So uh, there we are there. So uh, success, yay, yeah. So uh, our hello world has uh, has worked successfully. So uh, let me just pause at that point and uh, anybody want to throw out any questions? I think I, I answered the one that's in the chat there, but uh, any other questions at this stage? Cool, Grant. Uh, so let, let me move on then. Yeah. So so that was the first half of the talk, really. So the the first half of the talk was what problems did we face? Yeah. And uh, what is space and how was space part of the solution to our problem? And then uh, how did we make a start? You know, how did we prove to ourselves that we could automate uh, the uh, the creation and the population of space instances? So uh, once we got all of that done, we said, OK, uh, let's try and build, you know, an actual application. And uh, I came up uh, with the uh, the name Maurice. OK, it's very, very bad when you have to explain a joke. Uh, but we were having a discussion and uh, somebody said, OK, we need an application that rooms around space and uh, sets space up. And then as I thought, oh, well, it would be a space cowboy, you know, and then I remembered the line from the song, you know, some people call me the space cowboy, some people call me the gangster of love, some people call me Maurice, you know, so uh, that's how I came up with the name Maurice, you know, that's, uh, that's where it comes from. So again, the, the reason why we wanted to do uh, automation was every time we set up a delivery, well, we need to create an instance for the course. Uh, then we need to create administration accounts for the trainers. You know, Then we need to add a welcome blog post with, some, with setup instructions. And that's just boilerplate. You know? And then uh, we'll want to create standard projects. We'll have a, a project for examples, a project for exercises, a project for solutions. And those will contain repositories and so on. And then We'll want to create accounts for the students and so on. So um, as much as possible, uh, we wanted to go out and automate that. OK, so uh, how did we automate it? Well, we automated it by writing a DSL. OK, so uh, let me just show you this project here. So this is like a, a cut down version of Maurice. This is like a, a, a 10, 20 percent, you know, of uh, the, the functionality that we need. But it's enough to give you a, a feel for how it works. Uh, so what we did was we went out and created a, uh, a DSL, a domain specific language. OK, so again, uh, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kotlin, uh, creating DSLs is something that Kotlin is particularly good at. OK. Oh, little question there. Who created the Hello World app? Me. <laughs> OK, so uh, I, I wrote all of the code that you're looking at here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we went out and uh, we uh, we created this little DSL, okay? And uh, DSLs are something that Kotlin is particularly good at, okay? So as Kotlin uh, evolved as a language, in the beginning it was known for null safety. That was the thing uh, it was originally sold on. So uh, the Kotlin compiler tries very very hard, yeah, to prevent you making uh, null pointer exceptions. You know, it tries its hardest uh, to guarantee that you're never going to access a 
property or call a method uh, against a null reference. Yeah. So null safety uh, was what it was originally uh, known for. Uh, then it became known for uh, creating DSL. So th this is something that you could always do, you know. But once people have got their head around the uh, the null safety, they looked at it and they went, "Woo, DSLs." <laughs> okay. So for a while, that the main argument for adopting Kotlin was DSLs. Yeah. And then it was coroutines. Okay. So uh, you may have heard of the idea of coroutines or uh, lightweight threads or project loom in Java or whatever. Yeah. So uh, enough to say that Kotlin provides really good support for coroutines through something called suspending functions. So, uh, you know, that last year, that's where all the interest was. Uh, and then at the moment, all the interest in Kotlin is uh, down to multi-platform. OK, that's what all the cool kids are looking at these days. Yeah, because uh, Kotlin, like a lot of modern languages, it comes in a JS version and a native version. So uh, you can go out and you can write a React front end uh, using Kotlin JS. Uh, you can go out and write an iOS app. Uh, using Kotlin native and so on. So um, if you have a web app and uh, you have uh, an iOS app and uh, you have a standard Java application and uh, you want to have the same set of domain classes, you know, you want to have the same customer class or something like that, and uh, you want to share them across all of these, yeah, well, then you can do that using Kotlin multi-platform, you know, so you can uh, build a library containing classes that can be used from your React app, that can be used from your iOS mobile app that can be used from your Spring Boot app, you know, and so on. So, uh, you know, th those things were always kind of latent in Kotlin, but that's what it's been known from uh, for. So uh, initially known for null safety, then for DSLs, then for coroutines, uh, and then currently for multi-platform. So here uh, we're talking about DSLs. So uh, hopefully you've been looking at this as I was uh, wittering on, and you can see here that we're declaring a set of profiles. Yeah. So there's only one profile here to begin with, and then we're declaring a set of projects, and then we're declaring a set of blogs and so on. So the idea is that we can use this DSL to specify the things that we want inside the space instance. Now, I've got a bunch of slides here that show how the DSL was created from scratch. Yeah. And it would take about an hour to go through them properly. So we're not going to do that. OK. So what I'll do uh, is I'll give you the uh, the high speed version. OK. And uh, if you're interested in this, there's a whole section on the Kotlin language site about how to write DSLs. Uh, there's a bunch of presentations that go into it in a lot more detail. Uh, one by myself, uh, lots by people smarter than me. Uh, but as I say, let me just give you a high speed introduction. Uh, so you see here we've got a type called space instance and we've got a function called instance. OK, so whenever you call this function called instance, we're going to go out and create a new space instance object. So in Kotlin, the uh, the new is not required uh, as in Python, uh, as in Scala 3. So uh, I don't need to say new here. I can just say space instance and I can pass in the title that I was given and then I can say apply action. OK, so uh, what on earth is action? Well, you can see here action is uh, a lambda. It's a self-contained function, an anonymous function, whatever you want to call it. So uh, it's a lambda that takes nothing and returns nothing. So we know it's a lambda because of this syntax here. We know it takes nothing because of the empty parentheses. We know it returns nothing because of the keyword unit, but it does have a receiver. That's the space instance dot. OK, so what we're saying is we're saying that this uh, lambda will be executed in the context of a space instance. Whenever this lambda runs, there has to be a space instance object there. And that's what this will refer to. So this action that's going to be passed in, uh, this lambda, uh, if this is used within the lambda, well, then it will point to the space instance. Because you see here, we're saying space instance and then dot apply and action, where action is our lambda. You know, So the lambda will be executed. And within that lambda, this will refer to the space instance. So long story short, uh, that declaration, or those declarations, I should say, uh, let us write this code here. So you see we've got an instance function that takes a title, and then these braces here represent the lambda. So let's say I go ahead and I populate my space instance type with a method to create some profiles, a method to create some projects, uh, a method to create some blogs. And I go ahead and fill in those types. Uh, well, then that would take us to this stage here. So you can see that we're creating a space instance and then we're passing in a lambda 
And then here we're saying this dot profiles. So whenever I say profiles there, what I'm actually doing is I'm calling the profiles method of the space instance object. And if we look at this, we can see that this creates a profiles object and then itself takes a lambda. So that is a lambda that takes nothing and returns nothing, but it has a receiver of profiles. So uh, the DSLs are actually very simple in Kotlin because it's just the same trick, okay, that keeps being used time after time after time. Yeah. So here uh, we're calling the profiles method. Yeah. Uh, on the uh, the space instance object, and we're passing in a lambda. And within that lambda, this will refer to a list of profiles, okay? So here's our profiles object. It contains a list of profiles, and you see here it has a method called profile, and that's going to create a new profile, and we'll configure that profile by applying a lambda, and that lambda will have a profile as a receiver and so on. Uh, so uh, we uh, this code here yeah, is the lambda with receiver. And inside there, this points to the current profile object. And you can see we're setting the forename, the surname, and the, uh, the email. So uh, it's essentially just the same trick uh, being used over and over again. Yeah, so we can keep applying this trick uh, to build up a, a really powerful DSL. You know, so uh, happy days. Yeah. So again, uh, if I went through every detail, it would take an hour by itself. So uh, we'll, we'll just skip to this stage here. So uh, here's the uh, the same example that we have in the code. Yeah. So hopefully it's easy enough to read through and understand what's going on. So the idea uh, was that anybody should be able to configure a space instance, you know, so uh, even if you weren't a developer or you didn't really know a lot about space, uh, you would still be able to use this DSL uh, to go out and configure the instance, you know, and, uh, uh, and that's what we got to in the end. Uh, there was a little problem, though, and uh, this is a standard gotcha uh, whenever you're building DSLs uh, with Kotlin, so uh, it's worth knowing. Uh, because of the way the lambdas are nested, you can end up allowing things that you didn't want to, okay? So you see here uh, within profiles, yeah, I only want to be able to create profiles objects, okay? So within profiles, yeah, I only want to be able to create profile objects, yeah? Uh, but the trouble is I can nest profiles within profiles, yeah? So this is uh, an acknowledged weakness in the pattern. So the way that you get around that is just by declaring an annotation, yeah? So uh, you see here, I declared an annotation called space entity marker, and then I annotate that with DSL marker, okay? So that tells the Kotlin compiler that this type is going to be used in a DSL, okay? So you see here, I'm saying this type called space instance and this type called profiles and this type called profile and so on. Uh, they're all going to be used inside DSLs. So then it will turn off this nesting. So we'll no longer be able to nest profiles within profiles and so on. And uh, that will give us the uh, the final result that we want. So as I say here, um, here's the code. Yeah. So then uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to integrate that DSL. Pardon me, got a bit of a cold. And um, we want to integrate that DSL with the hello world code that we wrote, you know, the, the code for actually connecting to the server. And uh, it turns out that's a solved problem. OK, so uh, if you will bear with me and forgive me, I'm about to introduce a gang of four design pattern. OK, so forget about all the fancy fu functional programming stuff. We're going to go back to good old uh, uh, object oriented design patterns. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to use the visitor pattern, okay? So, uh, so what's a visitor? Well, a visitor is something which can visit a blog, visit a repo, visit a profile, visit a project, visit an instance, okay? So a visitor object is just something that can be tooled. It's currently visiting uh, one of these things here. And as you can see, the appropriate thing gets passed in as a parameter. Uh, and then we have uh, an interface called visited, yeah, and this is how a type indicates that it will accept a visitor, okay? Uh, so, for example, here's my space instance type. So, uh, re this represents the, the top level instance of space, and you can see it now implements the interface visited, yeah? So, uh, it, that means it has an accept method that can take a visitor. And what do we do? Well, we ask the visitor to visit the current instance object, and then we pass the visitor down, okay? So this is how the visitor pattern works, okay? So if you're given a visitor, well, you ask the visitor to visit you, yourself, uh, you know, and then you pass the visitor object on to all of your children. 
So we're asking the visitor to visit us, yeah? And then we're creating a list of the projects, the profiles, and the blogs. And for each of those, we're asking that thing, whatever it happens to be, to accept the current visitor, okay? So uh, inside a Kotlin Lambda, it you know uh, represents the current thing. So the, the idea is that the visitor object gets passed down the tree. So once we've put that infrastructure uh, in place, it's very easy uh, to write a visitor. You know, all we need to do is implement the interface DSL visitor and therefore override all of these methods here and put in whatever code we want. OK, so that the simplest visitor to write is usually a print visitor. Uh, that, that's how that you check that you've implemented the pattern correctly. So as you see here, for example, uh, we take in a blog and we just print out the title of the blog. You know, uh, we take in a profile and we just print out the details of the profile, the forename, surname, the email address, and so on, yeah. Um, so then what we needed to do was we wanted to create a visitor uh, that would actually create things. So we say, right, uh, this is where we need the Spring Boot web client. But it actually turns out that we need to, okay? Uh, because uh, by design in Spring, uh, if you create a, a standard application, it can pretty much read, okay? So uh, they wanted the functionality for creating things to be done by individuals, you know, not, not by uh, uh, applications, yeah? So what we need is we need two web clients, okay? So one running as a, what's called a service account, you know, using standard OAuth client authentication, and that's what we can use for reading stuff. But then we need to create another web client which is going to act on our behalf. So what we can do is uh, I can register to the instance as an administrator, and then I can get a special authentication token. And then if I give that to a web client object, then it will be allowed to do anything that I could do. OK, so uh, that's a, a deliberate part of the, uh, the design of space. So uh, we went out and created an, an interface and we said, OK, what are we going to need to do? So we'll need to find profiles, find projects, find blogs, and then create profiles, create projects and create blogs. And then we said, OK, the thing that implements that interface will be our Webflux space client, you know, because, of course, we're using the, uh, the Spring Boot Webflux library. So we're going to pass in two web clients. One of these will have been configured in exactly the same way as you saw in the Hello World. And then one of one of them will have been configured with a special token, uh, a special authentication string, uh, which we can use to create things. And then uh, we went out and implemented that. You know, So we added the functionality to visit things. We added the functionality to create things. So uh, if I show you the uh, the code here, uh, you can see that we have all the types that make up the DSL, okay? So whenever you're reviewing this yourself later, uh, if you choose to do so, uh, there's this sub package called DSL, and that contains all the DSL functionality that we walked through. Uh, then there's a visitor package, and that contains an implementation of the, uh, the visitor pattern. You know, there we have it there. And then we have a, a folder called web, and that contains our Webflux space client. Uh, which implements the uh, doo -doo -doo, which implements the space client interface. Uh, there it is there. And then uh, these are the types that represent the requests and responses, you know, that are going to go uh, up and down over the uh, the network. So long story short, I can go in here and uh, I can configure the DSL and then try and run it. OK, so let's uh, let's give it a go. OK, so we'll go here and we'll say that we'll have uh, a user called Pete Smith, okay? So they are going to be Pete Smith uh, at megacore.com. And then we'll have a new project here. So uh, let's just go in and call this uh, Rule Developer Group Kotlin Catas uh, 101. And we'll make this uh, project uh, it, 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 let's say. Uh, and then we'll go inside here. And um, we'll want to create a blog. So uh, let's just call this blog, I don't know, running the demo, the demo, there we are. And we'll say, take content from the file welcome.md. It'll look for that in a test folder, okay? So uh, I think I've customized all of that. So let's go out and give it a go. And uh, let us really, really hope that the, uh, that the demo gods are with us. So if I go out and run that. Yay. So it just had to build there, and then uh, it went out and it ran, and we have success. Woohoo! 
OK, uh, but don't take my word for it. Uh, let's just go back to the instance. And uh, if we look inside here, if we look at our people, first of all, yep, uh, we now have Pete Smith. Uh, if we look at our projects, we've got GDG Kotlin Katas 101. Uh, if we look at our blogs, yeah, running the GDG, GDG demo and so on. Yeah. So uh, we've successfully gone out and created uh, all the things that we wanted to create. OK. Uh, so uh, if you choose to do this for yourself, uh, you'll need your own space instance. Uh, the good news is you can get one for free. OK, so uh, uh, whenever you go to the JetBrains Space website, you can get instances in various tiers, you know, and uh, the, there is a free tier, you know, so anybody can get one and set one up and have a little play with it. You know, so this uh, this code should work perfectly well for you. OK. Uh, so let, let me just try and tidy all of this up with a, uh, a few conclusions. Yeah. So uh, what have we learned over the uh, the past year? Well, first of all, uh, we love JetBrains Space because it saved our bacon. You know, uh, it put us in a position where uh, we could go out and uh, we could uh, create training courses and uh, we could have all the resources that we needed to uh, run courses in a distributed environment. So, you know, so that's uh, that's great. So uh, space is intuitive and it works very well. Uh, and then the space API works just fine from spring five. OK, so as I always say to people, you know, uh, whenever you're testing any kind of distributed API, test it from different frameworks. You know, so uh, if you've written the thing in C sharp, yeah, test it from Ruby, test it from Python, test it from Java. You know, so uh, don't test an API uh, in the same language and frameworks that the thing was already written in. OK, so, uh, yeah, we used Kotlin and I assume uh, space is written in Kotlin as well. But we went out and we tested it from spring, you know, so that's good. So the, the space API uh, works just fine from spring five. Yeah. Uh, and then the automation does work. You know, we're, we're using the automation at the moment, uh, saves time, reduces stress, you know, and, and going forwards, uh, we're playing with all the interesting variations that we can use this for. Uh, this is going to make it easier for us to do hackathons and uh, ad hoc workshops and uh, all kinds of events and meetups like that. Uh, the downside, well, we still have this gap in the industry where uh, all the vendors are trying to encourage us to, uh, to do reactive programming. Uh, but at the same time, most APIs are not reactive yet. OK, so the, there's a kind of uh, gulf there, you know, the, that needs to be bridged. But there, the, there are ways around it, you know, but uh, that, that's just uh, a continuing irritation, you know, uh, in the industry. Yeah, uh, there is one way to get around it, uh, which is coroutines and, and suspending functions. You know, so what you can do is you can use Webflux. Yeah. But instead of using reactive programming, uh, you can use coroutines. You know, you can declare a function that would return a flux as being a suspending function instead. And that really simplifies things and makes it easier. You know, so there's a that there's opportunities there. Uh, and then one last thing. Uh, um, all of this is redundant. <laughs> OK, so uh, since I started work on this, yeah, uh, JetBrains have gone out and they've created their own space SDK. OK, so last I looked, this is still in beta, but it's something that they will eventually come up with. OK, so uh, this is written uh, in Kotlin, as far as I know, and runs on top of KTOR, I believe, you know, their, their RESTful services framework. And if you look down there at the code at the bottom, you know, it's uh, it's doing the same kind of thing that I just showed you there. Yeah. So uh, I was aware, you know, I, I knew that this would eventually happen. Uh, but this time last year, I didn't want to wait. OK, because uh, I was a very, very nervous uh, and B, I had some time in my hands, you know, so I uh, I went out and gave it a go. So um, well, whenever this reaches version one, uh, we might switch to it. Yeah. Or if we're very happy with what we've got, you know, maybe we'll stick with it. Uh, I don't know. But uh, if you were starting from scratch with JetBrains uh, space, you wouldn't need to do all the effort that we've done. Uh, you'll just be able to, uh, to adopt the SDK. Cool. So uh, that's my uh, my presentation. Yeah. So, uh, oh, I uh, just saw the question there. Is the Space SDK available now? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you can go out and you can get it and play with it. Uh, it it's up and available on GitHub. But as I say, it, it's still beta. You know, it hasn't reached version one yet. But you can, uh, uh, as far as I understand, you can go and have a play with it right now. Cool.
Uh, so uh, these are my contact details down the bottom. Uh, please feel free to use them uh, after the talk. As I say, all of these slides will be made uh, available to you and uh, we'll, we'll put up a, uh, a Git repo. Uh, that contains all the code I showed you. Yeah, but of course, as I say, to run it, uh, you'll have to get your own space instance. But you can go out and get one of those for free. Cool. Uh, you're muted, I think. I, 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 <laughs> I just want to say that we have another question. Yes. Uh, what are the advantages of five? Is that space five or sorry, spring five uh, even? Or, yeah, so uh, spring five provides full support for reactive programming, you know, and uh, support for more advanced versions of Java. Yeah, so uh, well, whenever you're using spring five, you can use all the functional programming stuff that's in modern Java, you know, or Kotlin. Yeah, and uh, also you have access to things like web flux, you know, so you have uh, the, the full power of reactive programming. So you can look it up. Uh, the, uh, the good folks at Pivotal have produced something called Project Reactor, okay? So Project Reactor is their like low level reactive programming framework. So uh, in Spring 5, they uh, they re-architected Spring uh, to use Project Reactor, you know? And uh, WebFlux is one um, example of that, yeah? But there are many other examples as well. So uh, Spring 5, uh, as far as I can remember, you know, uh, support for modern Java, support for functional programming patterns, and uh, reactive programming built in, you know, all the way through the framework. We get it. Any other question? Any other questions? It was really very, very helpful. Oh, um, sorry, just, uh, sorry, just one more there. Uh, is the migrate any current Spring REST controller to support WebFlux? Uh, yes, <laughs> okay. So what you can do is, uh, uh, you could actually do a copy and paste, okay? So let's say you have a, a Spring REST controller and it returns a list of customer, okay? So you could move it over to WebFlux and you could just return a list of customer and it would work, okay? Uh, but you would lose all the benefits of reactive programming, okay? But it would still work, yeah? So uh, what you would do instead is instead of the thing returning a, uh, a list of customer, uh, you would have it return a flux of, or a mon you know, uh, of customer and so on. Yeah. So uh, it is really, really easy uh, to uh, to rewrite, you know, existing spring code to use WebFlux. Um, I would hang one huge caveat on that, which is that the syntax is easy. Yeah. But are you actually going to get any benefit? OK. So uh, if you're going to rewrite any application, not just spring, any application to be reactive, well, then you want it to be completely reactive because uh, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link okay so um the, the syntax is easy getting something up and running would be easy uh getting something that had the same performance characteristics as the old application uh would be relatively straightforward you know uh but rewriting your application to be completely reactive and and therefore take full benefit of the reactive programming model that's more tricky <laughs> you know that that would be more work okay but definitely getting started yeah is uh, is very straightforward Thank you. Thank you, Rahul, also for your questions. And thank you, God, really, for your time. You're very welcome. appreciate it. Um, thanks, everyone, all our attendees. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I would like to have you always, God, whenever you have thank you very much. opportunity, any kind of knowledge you would like to share, more than welcome. Um, I don't have anything from my end. I'm going to share those slides on the post survey email. So everyone is going to get a, an, a survey email and on the bottom of this email, you will find a link to the slides. Um, I'm happy when you submit your survey after that talk. Um, let me know if you have any other questions, any other wishes. And again, Garth, thank you so, so, so much for the time. Hopefully uh, once we'll see you physically in Dubai, 
That would be what we doing uh, really well. a base of conferences. We are doing Dev Fest and other stuff as well. So when when the world will become normal again, <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe very much. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we will be happily really having you there in person. Um, so guys, that's it. I think for today. Um, let me know if you need anything, and um, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.